Thank you. Well, good evening. Tonight I would like to share with you the fascinating truth about life on other planets. Most people, according to statistics, believe that there is life in a universe. And concepts such as string theory and parallel universes suggest that there are many levels of existence beyond this physical. And this leads to the possibility of life on other planets where we are physically unable to inhabit, neither are we able to detect by our current science. But we are living in exciting times where many discoveries are made as our technology advances. But in general, I wouldn't describe ourselves as an advanced race, although some people uh, might like to think so. Admittedly, on July the 20th, 1969, we put, successfully put a manned air, a spacecraft on the moon. But we are still developing the uh, right technology to make similar landings on planets in the solar system. But over the decades, our science uh, and our medicine has greatly improved, and many are benefiting from this. But we are not as fast progressing in our, in our spiritual development, perhaps, as we should be. We only have to look at our world. There is still much jealousy, hate, greed, a hunger for power, hunger for money, which often is result in wars. And there are, as a consequence, there are many casualties. We have also sent many satellites into space to explore uh, this solar system and even beyond that. Uh, but why can't we see life on other planets? Because they exist on a higher material plane. We can't see them. We can't even detect them. And this is similar on Earth. We have different levels of existence. For example, when we pass on, we leave this physical body behind. But we continue living, we continue experiencing. In our um, auric body, or in a more subtle um, physical body. So we are more than the physical, because we are spirit. Within each and every one of us, there is a spark of God, spark of divinity, which connects us all to the wonderful source from where all life came. Everything in manifestation came from God. We also told that our body is solidified sunlight. Now, there are five major and five minor pranas flowing in 32 minute intervals uh, from and through the sun and they're held together by mind. So what makes everything different that we see is the level of evolution. Everything is going through evolution. We do, humans, animals, plant life, rocks, even the planets, the mighty suns, and so forth. We are all evolving. So the different levels of existence on Earth higher ones and lower ones. We can't see them with a naked eye, but there are mediums or psychics who are able to contact uh, people who've passed on. And many of them have received uh, messages from these and relay them to relatives and they prove them to be true. So there are many, many cases. We are on a physical level, a physical realm, level one, often is referred to, and there are four levels beyond this, uh, below this physical, sometimes referred to as the hells. There are also six levels or realms above this physical level, also called the astral realms. So where do we go when we pass on? Depending how we lived our lives, we will determine the level which we go to. So if we let uh, a good, decent, charitable life, helped people, um, and in various ways we can do that. We'll be drawn to that level where people have similar mindsets. Those who committed crimes, murderers, will be drawn to the vibrations of levels uh, where people do similar things or have done similar things. Neither, neither of these levels are as punishment. 
They're all for learning. And every one from those levels reincarnates on this physical level, level number one, where we are told that it is the most important level, where we learn the most valuable experiences. We'll still continue experiences uh, when we pass on on various levels, but this is, we are told, the most important one. And Dr. King, Dr. George King, founder of the Theory Society, has given uh, great lectures on this subject, Levels of Consciousness, part one and two. One of them is dealing with the spirit realms, and the second part is dealing with the realms of the masters, which is a very, very advanced level. So everything in manifestation is going through experience. And in this experience, our greatest teacher, our greatest friend, is karma. It's nothing negative, it's nothing to be afraid of. Because after all, how would we learn our lessons? Was it not for wonderful karma, a law of karma? So it's helping us along the way. And our reincarnatory cycle will continue until we have learned all the necessary lessons we have to learn on this earth. The Buddhists call it, uh, once we have broken away from the wheel of rebirth, we go through the highest form of initiation uh, that we can have on this earth called ascension. And once we have done that, then we continue learning on other planets in the solar system. And we are told we either go to Mars, Neptune, Jupiter, or Pluto. Not necessarily in that order, but these are the planets. But those masters who choose to stay on this earth, they'll stay on, in an ascended body or an ageless body. They never age. And so that in order to help mankind, those who are going through the same, um, you know, similar experiences until they too reach this higher stage of initiation, ascension. So they're called the Great White Brotherhood or the spiritual hierarchy of Earth who are holding the light on this Earth and helping mankind in many, many ways. There are male and female masters in this uh, order. Um, interesting thing Dr. King has said that he saw an initiation of ascension of a young Indian girl. And he said that was fairly unusual because generally a soul that inhabits a male body when it gets to that high stage, which was, I thought, quite in interesting, which to me would suggest that um, the spiritual hierarchy mainly consists of male masters. However, there are female masters as well. The spiritual and the political head of the Great White Brotherhood is the Lord Babaji who is from the planet Saturn, and he's been on this Earth for 3,000 million years, which is a very, very long time in the same body. And we are told that he will stay on this Earth for as long as he is required to, as he is needed here. And in a wonderful book, The Nine Freedoms, uh, we are given the major steps, nine major steps uh, upon our journey. The steps leading up to ascension and even beyond that. So it's a wonderful book to, to read and to refer to. But where are these levels in relationship to this physical level? So for example, in this temple, we're in this temple, on a higher level or higher realm, it could be in a mountain range. And higher, it could be in a temple. Higher, it could be uh, in, in the middle of the ocean. So it's quite fascinating because each level dovetails into one another. And we can't see them because they are just on a different level, a uh, different energy level. I'd just like to say a few words about Dr. George King, who he is, um, in case you're not familiar with the Theory Society. Uh, Dr. King, after the Second World War, um, I'll say threw himself into practice of various yogas for 10 years, 89 hours a day. 
and he also had uh, an outside job because he had to pay the bills and so forth. So it was an extremely down-to-earth individual. His hard work of yogic practice paid off because he was able to enter the much sought-after state of deep meditation in the East called Samadhi, where Kundalini, this female force lodged in the base of the spine, is raised in full through each chakra into a higher chakra, like the Christ center, and entered this deep state of meditation where the soul is bathed in the light of the spirit. Must be a very beautiful state indeed. So much wisdom was revealed to him. He became a knower, a true master. He was able to project from this, his body and visit other realms on this earth and was able to visit other planets in this solar system. And we have two fantastic descriptions of these visits, one to Mars, another one to Venus, in a book called You Are Responsible. He also received messages uh, from uh, masters on this earth and also beyond this earth. We call them uh, cosmic transmissions. Many of these cosmic transmissions were received in a trance state, in which again Kundalini is raised up into a higher chakra. And he was concentrating on a carrier beam, which conveyed the thought of the communicating intelligence. And at the same time, it just really shows what a fantastic concentrative abilities he had. At the same time, he also was able to detach from his conscious mind so he would not discolor the receiving message. It's absolutely fantastic. So apart from ad adopting a trans condition, Dr. King, um, I understand in the 80s, he started to receive mental transmissions in which he did not enter samadhi, but we ha he had this two-way communication from beings from other worlds and also of masters on this earth. They referred to him as primary terrestrial mental channel. In fact, his first contact he had from an intelligence from another world was uh, from Venus. And that was on May the 8th, 1954, when Dr. King was in his flat doing uh, house chores, washing up some dishes, when he heard a voice which said, prepare yourself you are to become the voice of interplanetary parliament. This intelligence was called the Master Sirius from the planet Venus. And since thereon, a year after, Dr. King founded the Athena Society in 1955. And over the years, he received over 600 transmissions, which is absolutely fantastic. Many of these have been recorded. We're going to hear uh, extracts from two of those but some are also available to purchase. So during the course of this evening, I'm going to give you examples of uh, conditions on planets of Mars, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn, and also of the inhabitants of those planets. By using our imagination, we'll be able to draw a picture in our mind what life on those planets might be like. Now, our imagination won't be 100% correct because we are only given a glimpse into those conditions and into those lives. However, this information will be very useful to us because it will widen our consciousness and give us a better understanding and appreciation of li life out there. Also, much of the information I'm going to share tonight were um, given prior to a great happening that took place on 28th of December, 1969. So conditions on those planets now could be very different, so please bear that in mind. And the happening I'm referring to is the initiation of the solar system, and this transmission was given by the Master Sirius, and I would like to read an extract from this. 
the initiation of all life forms on the major planets of this solar system, with the exception of Terra, has now been completed. This vast and involved cosmic movement gradually was put into operation over the past few of your months. But of course, a movement of this scale cannot be spoken of in a measured time sequence, as you on Terra know time. Terra here refers to the planet Earth. The great lords have planned this for many centuries and had to make it with, as you no doubt can appreciate, great care and only after giving full attention to major details. Another benefit which you upon Terra will reap from this cosmic movement will be that now the planets are open to your exploration. You can now live on some planets for 10,000 of your years. And until you are ready, you could still erroneously conclude that they were not inhabited, save by basic vegetation forms. Just as some dwellers from other parts of this galaxy could come onto Terra and be un unaware of the presence of terrestrial men, so you too can visit other planets without being aware of intelligent life, unless that intelligence sees fit to make its presence known. Now, I thought that was very fascinating, isn't it? So even when we have the technology, I said we, can, we could live there for 10,000 of our years, but if, if, there's, if the inhabitants don't want to reveal themselves, we won't see them. That's quite amazing. So this initiation, and Dr. King gives a fantastic lecture on seven dimensions of creation, because interestingly, in this transmission, the Master Aetherius says that this uh, happening took place. This cannot be spoken of in a measured type sequence as you on Terra know time. Now here is referring to is time being the fourth dimension, and Dr. King talks about the seven dimensions of creation. And again, it's another lecture I, I recommend you to listen to. So this initiation allowed life forms on Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and similar planets to change from one physical level onto a higher vibratory level without much less expenditure of energy. Now they were able to do it before, but now they, had to, they didn't have to expend so much energy in order to stay in a higher vibratory level. It was much easier for them. So we, we might why, wonder, why, why not Earth? Why are we excluded? Why are we not benefiting from these energies? We would have to look at our past. And over the centuries, you know, just look at our history. Over the centuries, um, we just involved ourselves. You know, war after war, crimes after crime, because of our wrong thoughts and actions. These energies rather than being beneficiary to us, probably would be detrimental because of our coarse bodies. And also, we didn't deserve them, did we? We have to prove ourselves to deserve such high energies. Now, I know the moon is not a planet, but I would like to start with the moon, because believe it or not, it is inhabited. And again, I would like to take an extract from a transmission, again, from the Master Series given in 1955. And uh, you can read the full transmission in Cosmic Voice, Volume 1. And he says that we have many bases upon Luna, which are used by people from other planets within the solar system as a jumping off base, live underground in plastic bubbles, plastic in inverted commas, probably they are not made out of plastic, but uh, Perhaps uh, we don't have such uh, material on Earth, so he uses the word plastic bubbles, which have been specially constructed. They manufacture their own, own atmosphere to create a gravitational weight, which is in keeping with their previous environmental conditions. Now, the actual lunar natives are another life 
form of life. They resemble the forms of intelligent life found in certain astral realms inasmuch as their bodies are made of tenuous matter, as are your own auras. They do not inhabit bodies formed of skin and bones. They go to Luna for certain experiences. They live around the moon, but they come very near to its surface, which enables them to feed on the natural magnetic fields of the moon itself. In this way, they can be cured of certain mutative diseases, which have been brought on through wrong thought and action in previous lives. Now, Dr. King, in a lecture, Life on the Planets, given in 1961, he says a bit more about this. That there are certain people who, when they die, they need to go on the moon, to the settled realms of the moon for help, guidance, and for a certain process of recharging. There is an etheric realm around the moon which is inhabited by people from this earth, who go there for a limited time in order to be recharged by the magnetic energies that come from the moon. You couldn't see this belt, it is invisible, just as your own astral realms are invisible. So there are some people who, because of their wrong thoughts and actions, so we would assume they're on a lower ladder of evolution, probably from lower realms, I'm guessing, go to a moon for certain experiences, help and guidance, and for a certain process of recharging. Very interesting. Another interesting fact about the moon is that there was a traveling ban lifted uh, to the moon on 22nd of August 1964. So before that, we, were, we could not, even if we had the technology, we, we would not be able to successfully land on the moon because of certain bases there. So that has now been lifted, and um, 69, and uh, five years later, almost, we did land on the moon successfully. Let us now look at one of our planetary neighbors, planet Mars. And there is quite a bit of information on Mars, much more so than on the other planets in the solar system. It is also called the Father Earth. It is a male entity. So just as we have a, a spark of God within us, so do the planets have logos or life force, very, very advanced uh, beings. Supercosmic super masters, as Dr. King refers to them. So it is a male entity, the planet Mars. Now, the vegetation on Mars is very, very, very different to that on Earth, and we'll see why. The so-called canals of Mars are vegetation belts that stretch from pole to pole. These are so advanced that they're able to move physically from one point to another. They also release oxygen into the Martian atmosphere. And what's interesting about that is that NASA researchers have detected atomic oxygen in Mars atmosphere. And even scientists admitted that our technology is not advanced enough. So that's quite, quite something. A normal tree on Mars is 1,000 foot tall. A normal flower may have leaves the size of a five or six story block of flats. And Dr. King, who has visited Mars, said that he's seen a flower with a petal as large as a concert hall. So it's quite big. <laughs> They've got quite large, quite, quite large vegetations on Mars. And uh, if we wanted to smell the flowers on Mars, we would have to jump very, very high or just levitate up. There are two moons revolving around Mars, Phobos and Deimos. And the smaller of the two moons, Phobos, is an artificial satellite made by the Martians. It just shows what fantastic engineers they are. It is used as a weather controlled station and also as a communications headquarters. And Dr. King has had communications from there with an intelligence called Mars Sector 8. Their cities are spotlessly clean, which is a bit difficult to imagine for us, isn't it? And uh, the buildings have shaped power, and they have buildings on the surface and beneath the surface of the planet. 
In fact, all evolved planets use shape power. And this is to attract the prevalent magnetic conditions or currents of the planet itself, and also uh, to attract spiritual radiation sent out by the masters on Saturn. And we are told that the pyramids on Earth also have shaped power. So there you go, there's a bit of food for thought. How did it um, happen to be there? Now, the population of Mars, Mars is much smaller than of Earth. The Martians consciously inhabit the etheric realms as well as the physical realms, unlike us. We're only consciously aware of our physical level. In the etheric realms, you have aspect number one, which joins in spiritual union with its twin soul. So if it, one is a male, another one is a female. Male, female, or positive and negative. And this union uh, is a spiritual one. And this perfectly balanced pair has their second aspect, number two, as twin souls live in physical bodies beneath the surface of the planet. They also form aspect number three, which is their traveling aspect. And if it is necessary for the intelligence to be introduced into a life cycle, let's say, of this Earth, then a fourth aspect is formed. This is a more basic aspect. But the main Martian intelligence is aspect number two, which is in the physical body, and aspect number one is in the etheric realms or the higher consciousness realms. Again, Dr. King gave a, a great lecture on four aspects of creation if you're interested on this subject. Uh, the Martians are mainly builders, engineers, and highly qualified technicians and use thought-controlled robots for various kinds of work. Now, this is absolutely mind-blowing what they're capable of. At least 75% of all interplanetary vehicles are manufactured on Mars. They don't have a monetary system, so let's say if uh, a planet requires 2,000 or 7,000 spacecraft, they're given to them free of charge. Of course, they are used for peaceful purposes, not for fighting wars. They're great engineers and masters of thought control. And just to give you an example, this is mind-blowing. So a Martian scientist could sit 150 miles beneath the surface of the planet and direct a fleet of craft outside of the solar system by thought. It will take us a little while <laughs> we can do that. And just give you another example of an advanced machinery they have on Mars. Let's not be jealous here because it is really good. So a piece of machinery could be set up and it could be run by an electronic brain for 50,000 years. This is 50,000 of our years. It will be self-adjusting and self-lubricating using light rays. And some of the flying sources can be 300 and 400 thousand years old, and they're made of organic uh, material, and it can grow again. Now, it's quite different from the transport on Earth. We'll still use um, oil to fuel our cars. Uh, they're definitely not self-adjusting or self-lubricating. We have to take it into a garage for an engineer. And if anything breaks off, it definitely doesn't grow back again, unfortunately. And um, I thought it was quite humorous when Dr. King said that there is a little difference between people on Earth and the Martians. About 16 million lives. <laughs> so what do the intelligences on Mars look like? Uh, Dr. King reported to have had a contact with a Martian intelligence not so far from here, Putney Common, in 1958, and he was about eight feet tall. He also gave uh, another description of uh, another Martian intelligence he met on satellite number three, the giant spacecraft, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. This intelligence was seven feet tall with broad shoulders, narrow waist, and abnormally small feet for a man of his stature. And Dr. King also said that the Martians have extremely large hands. His skin was so suntan that it looked glossy cinnamon color. 
He wore a one-piece suit tied from the neck to the ankles, no seam, pocket, or even a fold in a suit. It seemed to fit him as though it had been poured around him. He looked 30 years of age, but was around 300, Dr. King guessed. His eyes were dark and deep. In his eyes, he saw the depth of wisdom he has never seen in any terrestrial eyes. His long brown silken hair hung down to his broad shoulders. And uh, Dr. King said that the Martians are excellent telepaths and are exceedingly handsome. And I suppose you would accept, expect that since um, you got a very advanced spiritual being that must be absolutely beautiful. And this description and um, Dr. King uh, meeting this Martian on satellite number three is, is uh, described fully in the Nine Freedoms book. Now we're going to listen to a short extract from an intelligence called Mars Sector 6, who is in fact a control of satellite number three, and is going to briefly talk about teleportation on Mars. So for that, you may just want to, if you wish, close the eyes and just listen to the words and the energy and see what you feel. Because we're going to later on listen to another communicator who is very different. And although the Martians are much more evolved race than we are, they're still learning and going through evolution, going through experience. They do have schools on Mars built on, of crystals so that the younger ones, as Dr. King uh, called it, may be impregnated with the magnetic vibrations coming from the solar system. And most of the teaching is done through telepathy because words for them is inadequate and also uh, unnecessary to express the truth or their science. The beings on Mars realize that the planet upon which they live is a living, breathing entity, just as the Earth is. They bathe in the radiations of the logos of their planet. Similarly, like on Earth, we can too visualize the violet flame coming up from the logos of the Earth, the Mother Earth, this velvety violet flame which has protective and transmuting qualities. But the Martians don't have to rely on imagination because they have built a temple. And they can, and it in fact is in the center of Mars, and they can recharge themselves through the uh, energies, rejuvenate their bodies coming from their logos. We live on energy too, but we have much coarser bodies, so we take in energy, prana, in different ways, uh, through the food we eat, the liquid we drink, or the air we breathe. 
Generally speaking, the Martians don't eat or drink, but there is a small percentage of the population that does eat, but not meat. They don't eat meat. They do breathe, and there are adepts at the science of breath. There is no physical sickness on Mars, no poor class, no health as we have on Earth, no political system, and no old age. In fact, Dr. King said that when a Martian knows that he should disengage himself from his physical body, he goes to a special place, like a temple. He disengages himself from his physical body, he then splits up every cell and molecule of this body and recombines it again in another, another body of a finer structure, inhabits that body again, and that's the initiation. And they can inhabit their newly formed body for 2,000 or 6,000 years. Interestingly, once an earth master uh, moves on from this earth, gone through ascension, moves on, and is to be reintroduced into a life cycle of Mars, they are born through the flame of the Logos of uh, Mars, as an adult, not as a child. And this is the only time when they are born in that way. Having said that, what's fascinating is that there are few children on Mars. Dr. King says, just a few for a certain good reason. Now, he doesn't say what the reason is. I suppose it's something for us to <laughs> meditate on, or um, I'm sure the information will be given to us one day. But it's interesting because when a master from this earth is introduced into life cycle of Mars, they're born as an adult. There are no children on Venus, Jupiter, or Saturn. So the Martians are a highly advanced race and see God as a profound symbol. That there is a complete interrelationship between all existing things. That God is all things and all things are God. It's a wonderful concept, isn't it? And even though um, things are on a different evolutionary stage from uh, perfection to a rock, so what kind of help are we getting from Mars? Well, one of the helps we are getting is um, and satellite number three, this large spacecraft, comes into orbit of our world four times a year. We call them spiritual pushes or magnetization periods. And it comes 1,550 miles from the surface of Earth. And it's a Martian spacecraft, egg-shaped, about 2.27 miles long controlled by Mars Sector 6, who is a very advanced cosmic master. He's a lord of karma. And the operators on satellite number three are also very advanced because it takes them about 30,000 plus years, Earth years, for them to be able to manipulate the advanced equipment aboard this craft. Satellite number three can't be seen because it's cloaked with um, invisibility, a screen. And it can also absorb any tracking devices like a radar. So we cannot see it or detect it, but we definitely can feel the energies radiated through this uh, floating temple of light. All we have to do is engage in unselfish spiritual action doing voluntary work, you know. Uh, you could even be an atheist and benefit from these energies. It's the actions that count. And our actions, our unselfish actions, are potentized by 3,000 times. Now, for us to enhance prana 3,000 times, we would have to be on the verge of adeptship. So since 1955, since uh, we know that satellite number three came in orbit of our world, we'll, we've been helped. We don't have to believe in life on Mars. We don't have to believe in satellite number three. All we have to do is for anyone to pray, perform an unselfish act, and they will advance 3,000 times more quickly during a spiritual push than outside of it. And service is essential in these days. Service will help us
towards enlightenment. And if we want a balanced um, spiritual uh, development program, it should always include some form of service, sending out white light out to the world, sending out to individuals, you know. The next planet I would like to talk about is the planet Jupiter. We are told that beings from Jupiter have been on Earth many times, so have the Martians. And Jupiter is about 630 times the size of Earth. It has 11 moons, out of which four is natural and seven are artificial. And the artificial moons have been manufactured by the Martians. These satellites are temples used for initiations and also seats of learning. And there are many intelligences traveling billions of miles to these seats. And some of them are healing sanctuaries as well. Because of its size, Jupiter is a reception center of the solar system. There is no uh, transport on Jupiter because it's not uh, necessary for them. So they can materialize or dematerialize wherever they wish to go. However, if the visitor is incapable of transporting through mass, then the Jupiterians can sink into being a suitable uh, craft for the visitor. And once it's no longer needed, they take it out of being. So there's no energy is wasted. Unlike on Earth, many people don't even believe that thoughts are real things. Um, never mind taking these thoughts back into ourselves, which we can do. There is a wonderful practice in the book, Realize Inner Potential, where we can take back into ourselves, into a solar plexus center, any negative or unwanted thoughts, which will declutter our mind as well. So they use spacecraft uh, to transport equipment, and most buildings on Jupiter are underground. Again, they use shape power and power of vibrations of crystals. Very advanced race. They radiate music, perfume, and color to the whole solar system. And we are also benefiting from these energies. You know, composers like Wagner and Mozart, you know, are benefiting, did benefit from these energies. Or painters like Turner creating wonderful works of art. And the perfume energies, perfume radiations, enhance the culture of a race. Dr. King says that perfume is the energy which does enhance culture. Unfortunately, we haven't got any physical description of the beings on Jupiter. They too have learned to contact the logos of their planet, and they live on these radiations. They don't eat and they don't breathe. So they live on the rays coming from the locus of their planet, on solar energies, on their perfume, music, and color energies, and these sustain their bodies. Now, Dr. King had some communications from Jupiter, but it was very difficult because they don't breathe and sometimes they had to be reminded to pause so Dr. King could breathe while he was in trance condition. So just to give you an example, we're now going to listen to uh, another transmission from Jupiter Sector 9-2, and he's going to talk about the inside elements. Again, the compassionate, peaceful, and highly advanced race, not just scientifically, but also spiritually, are superiors. Let us move on to our third planet, Venus. The Venusians give great service to the whole solar system. They travel to different parts of the Milky Way to give their love. 
not love to any individual, but the love to all, because they love all. This is an impersonal love, which is so beautifully described in the Nine Freedoms. So they give their teaching, their enlightenment, their wisdom, their understanding, their healing to all planets that will open their door to these great masters. The master Jesus and the Lord Buddha was from planet Venus. Although terrestrial man did not open their doors to these great masters to benefit from their wisdom and from their help, these masters uh, still came to this earth to help mankind, to perform their mission. And for them, in order to do this, they had to be introduced into a life cycle of this planet for a certain period of time. The Master Jesus is a younger brother of the Lord Buddha, and he gave the beautiful 12 blessings, which we actually uh, perform online, you can tune in at 12blessings.org every Sunday at 5.30 p.m. We'll tune in, we'll do this practice, send out power to each focal point, 12 focal points. One of these is those who work for peace, those who heal us, the Mother Earth, recognizing as a living, breathing entity, the great galaxy, and so forth. And the 12 blessings were given in 1958, in the George King Chapel, where actually the uh, online service takes place from. The Lord Buddha is still around Earth in a spacecraft called Shambhala, which is just above the Gobi Desert. So we are helped by masters on Venus in many, many ways. But what do they look like? Dr. King had a physical contact with the Master Jesus on Holson Down on 23rd of July, 1958 when the Master Jesus uh, physically appeared from a spacecraft and uh, directed spiritual energy uh, through Dr. King into the mountain, making it holy. So we have 19 holy mountains that were similarly charged by other intelligences. And uh, we actually hold a pilgrimage to Holston Down. We'll be going there on 23rd of July this year. But I would like to share with you um, a description of another Venusian. Now, Dr. King describes the Master Jesus in Holston Dan in a book called Jesus Comes Again. And Mary King's account, who's the mother of Dr. King, can be found in Cosmic Voice, volume 15. And she said this. This was given on 25th of January, 1958. He was about... Uh, Six foot four inches in height, slim with white hair, the shun like silk. Eyes were bright as bluebells. Hands exceedingly long and slender, and a face and skin which were tanned almost a golden cinnamon color. His hairless skin was smooth and glossy. He was wearing a suit of brown material, all in one piece from neck to ankles, and it seemed to cross over the chest, but I could see no buttons or zips. His shoes were of the same color brown, very soft and pliable, certainly not made of any kind of leather, but was a cord fastening each shoe. He wore no hat or covering on his head. And Mary King estimated his age, uh, three, 30 or maybe 300. Again, he was very youthful looking. His lips were faded pink color, had no wrinkles on his face or forehead. He had veins, but no prominent knuckles showing. And the flesh on his hands seemed to be firm like the well-covered hands of a boy, so very useful looking. From the wrist to the tip of his fingers was easily 12 inches. Although the nails were cut to the top of each finger, there were some three times the length of those of an earthman. They were oval in shape of a pinkish white color with a white margin showing at the top of each nail. And when this Venusian walked into the home of Mary King in North Devon, she smelled perfume when he entered. 
She described it as a million hyacinths and lilies of the valley, all mingled together. He had lovely teeth. They were not the same shape as the teeth of most earthmen. They were rather larger and a bit narrower. He did not have a broad teeth in the front like most people, and his chin was clean cut and firm. His hair was pure white. Every hair was exactly the same color, so he had no tints um, in his color. And concerning his eyes, we know it was blue, and the whole of his iris was blue, floating in a sea of white. He had no dark uh, pu pupils to the eyes, as we have. The white of the eyes was dead white and had no pinkish veins in them like a normal eye. And he had a liquid voice. He did not chop off his words. One flowed smoothly into another, it's something like a quality of a running water. It's a very interesting description by Mary King. Dr. King said about the Venusians, that they are very beautiful people. They have great wisdom and vast power, and they have learned from the masters on Saturn how to communicate directly with the logos of their planet. So it's very different. It just shows again they're much more advanced than the beings on Mars and Jupiter who got the temple, and they're tuning into the radiations, the energies emanated from their logos. But the masters on Venus, they have learned to communicate with their logos. And this is what the master theorist said. Certain of our chosen masters are now capable of holding direct communion with the master called Venus. In turn, this entity can communicate through the 12 ancient ones upon Saturn, directly with the great masters of the sun, and at times, directly with the sun as an entity. It's absolutely mind-blowing. And yes, there is life even on the sun. On the surface of the planet Venus, there's a crystal temple which is the spiritual center of Venus. And there's another temple in the heart of the Logos. And these two temples form a magnetic line from the heart of the planet to the surface. And there is a, a wonderful description of this spiritual center of Venus, this temple on Venus, by Dr. King when he visited Venus. And this is in You Are Responsible book. The Venusians don't eat, drink, or breathe. They purely live on solar energy. Now, what's interesting, I thought about that, was that Dr. King had many communications from uh, the masters on Venus, particularly from the master Theodos and the master Jesus. Yet, they don't breathe. However, he had difficulties having communications from uh, beings on Jupiter who also don't breathe. Um, I think it just really shows their advancement. Doesn't it? I thought it was just an interesting thought. The master theorist said that some of our young ones eat and drink the juice from certain berries and the juice which is given off by certain trees. And here the young ones is referring to animals. They have animals on Venus. We don't know what they look like, but we know that the temperature varies between 110 and 150 Fahrenheit, which is about 43 Celsius and 65 Celsius. It's fascinating because uh, you wouldn't have this information anywhere else, <laughs> would you? So let us now turn our focus to our final planet, the most evolved planet in this solar system, which is Saturn. And what's fascinating about the planet itself is that Dr. King revealed that a planet has seven lives from the sun. But it might choose to have an eighth life, like Saturn is in its eighth life. Saturn has chosen to stay in the solar system to help the inhabitants of this solar system. Very, very compassionate beings. Venus is in its sixth life, and Earth is in its third life, 
which is just is thousands of millions of years behind the planet in this solar system. So the masters on Earth, when they leave Earth, they enter life cycle of Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, or Pluto. From there, they move on to a higher experience cycle on Venus and Uranus, and from there to, the, to Saturn. And there is, a, again, there's a brilliant description in the Nine Freedoms. On the surface of the planet is the Temple of Silence, and it is made by thought of pure crystal. These crystals live and grow together, and the building has a life of its own. And it is the manifested aspect of the logos of the planet Saturn. It must be absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. There's a great silence within the temple where the uh, 12 perfects reside immobile. And beneath the surface is a great light which is radiated from the bodies of the masses of Saturn who live among the general inhabitants of the planet itself. And these inhabitants come from many planets, and they come for experience and for high cosmic initiations. Saturn is the seat of learning within and also outside of this solar system. There is no transport on Saturn because the masters don't ever move from one place. We also told that on Saturn, the great ones are fully aware of existence on seven planes at the same time. They're very advanced masters. They can split their consciousness into 1,860 parts and inhabit them at the same time. And the 12 perfects can double this feat. Sri Krishna, who graced our planet, was from planet Saturn. I mentioned the Lord Babaji is also from the planet Saturn, who is now living on Earth. Of course, his full aspect will still be on Saturn. And it was from this planet that came the science of shape power. And beneath the surface are the temples of learning and the temples of judgment. Now, this is interesting because before we reincarnate, onto this physical level, we go to the Hall of Judgment where we will determine our next life. No one is going to judge us. We're going to um, judge ourselves, a higher self. We're going to judge ourselves. So the uh, necessary uh, conditions uh, we have for our next life and I would like to read an um, extract, and this is from a lecture, Dr. King Cave on Saturn. And this is a wonderful description of what happens in a hall of judgment. You notice in front of you a crystalline substance, rather in a shape of a very large upturned glass, some 20 to 23 feet in height. Inside that huge upturned crystalline glass, there is something which looks like a huge incandescent egg, which is hovering about three or four feet from the floor and some 15 to 18 feet in height. And you know that in that incandescent egg, radiating thousands of colors, is a great and vast intelligence. You stop still in awe because you know this intelligence knows you far more completely than you have ever known yourself at any time. But you also know that this intelligence will never condemn you, will help you, will guide you, but never condemn you and you suddenly become aware of where you are. You are in one of the tribunal halls of Saturn, and as you stand or hover, there you know that you will return to that place again, 
you know that you will look again upon that great intelligence. And you know that when you do, this intelligence has been in this meditative state for 50 to 60 thousands of your earth years without moving one iota and yet at the same time has split its consciousness into 2,000 different parts and is fully aware even as you stand and look at it of what each part is doing even though they might be millions of miles apart scattered right throughout the galaxy. You are standing in one of the tribunal halls of Saturn. You know that you will return. When you have passed this initiation called death, you will return to this place. The great intelligence in front of you is one of the perfects. You will come before this great being, but not to be condemned not to be torn asunder, but to be built up. For this being will teach you the great secret. And the great secret is, he will teach you how to judge yourself. So there you go. We've all been to Saturn many, many, many times, but we just can't remember it. And from, and these are the perfects, from their mighty source, pour forth the rays of inspiration out into every life stream in the solar system so that it may be impregnated with these mighty rays. They vibrate through you, that the great streams of coursing life, they are life. So this is the kind of help. Uh, we get from these beautiful beings. They're sending their healing, the uplifting energies, which is helping us through our evolution. So we have been visited, visited on this earth many, many times, and some have been done in secret because of the nature of the missions. But there was one a fascinating visitation that Dr. King shared with us, and that was by a lesser lord of karma. There is a hierarchy um, in, in, the, in the whole of creation. And uh, obviously there are lords of karma, which is, uh, Mars Sector 6 is one of those. But this lesser lord of karma visited the solar system, I believe it was in the 1950s. And his spacecraft was 19 million miles long. very big one, isn't it? <laughs> I was trying to, I can't even visualize it, 19 million miles long. How long is that? <laughs> but we had numerous accounts of visitations that have been witnessed by people, by officials and military personnel as well. Uh, all we have to do is just type in into a search engine UFO sightings and we get over 3 million results. But unfortunately, and I think science is changing, but unfortunately, science is still just looking at the physical. And even when we have the technology and we are living in this, on those planets, we will still not make contact because we are not ready. We want a sign, don't we? Science wants sign. So there is an answer from Mars Sector 6. It says, my many brothers of Terra have required from us a sign. Many signs have been given by people from other planets, signs which should have been proved to thinking terrestrial men beyond any doubt, that we do exist, that we are indeed living entities, that we have indeed the interest of terror at heart. As numerous, though, as these signs have been, they still do not satisfy certain terrestrial intelligences. I ask my brothers from Terra who require as a sign a landing of one of our craft in a prominent position to give us a sign. Science has requested a sign from si flying saucers. I ask science to give us their sign. What sign do we require? Their goodwill. 
their complete, open-minded honesty, and their, profound, and their proof that if we reveal to them the secrets of the vibrations of crystals, these secrets will be used for the benefit of all. We cannot reveal our science to the scientists of Terra until they prove to us their godliness. Because what would happen should we have their science? Would it be used for the betterment of our world? I think we all know the answer. Probably it would be used for fighting each other. And we could destroy each other, which is not the idea. So we have to change. And the cosmic masters can only help us as much as is permitted within the karmic law. And often, karma has been stretched for our benefit. They can't land openly and take away all the responsibilities and all our troubles from our shoulders. How would we learn from our mistakes? We wouldn't learn. It would not be helpful to us at all. They can only help, guide us, and indeed they, they do protect us as well. They give their wisdom, the wonderful spiritual energies, their unconditional and impersonal love to all, and fortunately to us, they come in peace. Because should they be warlike like we are on Earth, we wouldn't have a, a chance against such an advancement as theirs. Having said that, not all uh, extraterrestrial beings are friendly. But we have uh, fortunate to have the protection of the cosmic masters. Because we don't have the technology or even the know-how to protect ourselves. And um, in a book, again, You Are Responsible, there is a great story called The Mars Story, when actually um, we were threatened by um, a belligerent race. There was another great happening that took place in this solar system on July the 8th, 1964, and that was the primary initiation of this Earth, when the logos of this Earth received great spiritual energies from cosmic sources, greater than she has ever received since her inception as a planet. But the Earth had two choices to make either to release these energies, and therefore all life on Earth would perish because uh, we just not advanced enough to withstand these energies, these very high vibratory energies, or release these energies gradually over the years. And because we are still alive, that's exactly what she's doing, which is not better for her. Again, She's thinking about us. So the Earth, the planet Earth, is a great and compassionate being. And that means that all life on Earth will be quickened. That the new age of world peace and enlightenment will dawn on this world. And those people who are ready, those people who want to help others, those people who are spiritually minded and care about other life want to live in peace and freedom will stay on this earth. And those who want to carry on with fighting, murdering, and so forth, they can continue to do that on a younger planet. Which is, we are told by Dr. King that it's in the solar system, but just outside of it. So within the influence of the solar system. And what's interesting about that is that there is an evidence of a ninth planet in this solar system. Now it's the ninth, not the tenth, because unfortunately, Pluto is no longer a planet. So it was professors um, at the Californian Institute of Technology, Constantine Batkin and Mike Brown, they were speaking about a new research that provides evidence of a giant planet tracing a bizarre, highly elongated orbit in the outer solar system. Now, this is absolutely mind-blowing. It is larger than Earth and smaller than Neptune, this planet. 
It is about one to 10 times the size uh, of Earth. It's much further away from the sun than the other planets in the solar system. Are you ready for this? Its orbital period around the sun is 20,000 years. It is 60 billion miles from the sun. And as we know, the Earth is 93 million miles. And Konstantin Bajkin said that history shows us that it's a bad idea to consistently say that we have now reached the end of the solar system and there is nothing beyond what we already know. I would say it's a very, very open-minded uh, uh, scientist indeed. So times are changing. But the cosmic masters in their great compassion have a dream for our world and it, is, it should be a vision for us into the future. In a transmission extract by Mars Sector 6 given on 9th of, 9th of December 1956, entitled Heaven and Earth, he said this. Imagine, O oh brothers, your Earth being at peace. Imagine, O oh brothers, all men upon your Earth having perfect bodies and perfect minds and perfect memory throughout the long ages of their existence. Imagine, O oh brothers, you visiting other planets and consulting with them and trading with these planets and bringing back to your Earth metals which will never oxidize, will bring back crystals which will give you 10,000 times the power of any atom so that all power upon Terra is equally distributed Imagine being able to embrace any and all men and being embraced by them. This is the dream which has been held by a few. This is the dream which can become manifestation if the few exert influence over the many in peaceful ways, by prayer, through meditation, through service, through the absorption of every energies I'm controlling at the moment. Look at the picture I have given to you. Look at the picture of your world as you now see it. See the difference. Then my friends, it is up to you to build a bridge over the chasm of a difference and cross bravely. If ever I saw a planet which was yearning for some spiritual leadership, then that planet is Terra. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? Wouldn't it be great to have uh, perfect minds, perfect memory, um, and you know, not have sickness or old age on this planet? But this will happen one day. So we are here on this Earth to experience and evolve, to reach upwards into the spark of divinity within us and be guided by it upon our journey back to God. And it is a process. We are also encouraged to help others to do the same. We are receiving much help, guidance and protection from the cosmic masters as much as allowed by the karmic law. But we should thank the Creator for these glorious beings, for their guidance, help, and profound inspiration that we have received over the centuries. Thank you.